Uh, I'll be very brief, but, but just quickly, um, participant exists uh, under the firm belief that uh, good storytelling can actually contribute to real, uh, real positive change in the world. And this is a movie that's uh, over the past year has, has always been close to our heart, but is, I think, is in light of what's been going on um, over the past 12 months, is even more uh, close to our heart in terms of what it is that we're trying to accomplish as a company. And I was just chatting with a couple of my colleagues and, and talking a little bit about the, the history of the development of the movie. And this is actually a movie that we, we uh, our company's only 12 years old, but this is a, a film that was in development for almost nine of those 12 years. And uh, is, a, is a film that we wanted very much to, to build a conversation through a film about hate and the consequences of hate, um, uh, and also the importance of free expression, um, all wrapped up in, in you know, a, a pretty engaging, strong, um, pretty thrilling drama. And it took us quite a while to, to develop and get to the place where we were, where we were ready to make it. And interestingly, it, when it came out in October, um, and this is one of those things about filmmaking is I don't think any of us really believed that we would be standing here today with, a, with an American president that we didn't expect to have and that a film that we'd worked on for so long would actually become more of the moment and more, and more important to the, to the conversation that's going, around, going on in our world today. So that's a long way of me saying that films have lives and they live, they live over a, a, a often a very short period of time or, or a very long period of time. And one of the important things for us is that the conversation that the movie engenders and the entertainment that it gives people at the same time, we'd like to last as long as possible. And so here I am in, uh, in April. Um, the movie originally came out in October in the United States, things have changed uh, pretty dramatically and, and, uh, and it's an important conversation and having the chance to show it to you uh, six months after we originally showed it is something that we really, really appreciate um, and is very important to us. So thank you very, very much for coming. Um, after, after the movie, we're gonna have a Q&A with several people and a special guest, uh, Deborah Lipstadt, who is the heroine of our movie and the, and the topic will be here. Um, I think you'll find her just as incredibly dynamic as Rachel plays her in the movie. She's just as dynamic and, and uh, she's a, you know, is a true fighter uh, for what's important and, and for what we believe in. So uh, I encourage you to stay for the Q&A. And in the, in the, just along the lines of, of movies and the, their life, this is also a movie that I probably get more, I've been in this business for about 30 years, and this is a movie that I get more emails about from people over the longest period of time than just about any movie I've ever been involved with. And I encourage you to ask her about when she saw it on a plane uh, about a month ago and the reaction of a couple people who saw it. It's a pretty good story. So thank you very, very much and enjoy it. Thank you so much for being here today to watch this film, Denial, and you are in for a very, very special treat with our panel. I'd like to invite them all to come out and join me now. So I'm not gonna waste any of the time going through bios uh, about our panel. One in particular, I think you now know a lot about. But please join me in welcoming Ben Barco. Deborah Lipstadt. And Melina Unkafer. So before we start, I thought I'd tell you a little bit of a story about the film that you just watched. Um, one thing that I did not know before I joined Participant Media, uh, but my boss, Jeff Skoll, who's the executive producer of this film, taught me is that some films come together very quickly. 
you get an idea, film comes together, it's off to the races. Others take quite a bit of time to come together. This film in particular took almost 10 years to come together. And the irony is that in that process, sort of a sad irony, when the film came out, it was unexpectedly and quite sadly more timely than we ever could have anticipated. Some of the lessons that are in that film are things that we are, we are living in, in current context. And we're gonna have a conversation about the film and, and uh, a lot of current events as well today. So Deborah, I'm gonna start with you. Um, so this unbelievable part of your life, this very powerful, very painful, and ultimately very triumphant period of your life was made into a film. And I'm wondering if you might just start us off by sharing what it is like to see your life turned into a film. Well, it's a little bit of an out-of-body experience. You know, um, I, I was on the set quite a bit when they were filming it. And I remember one day, I, I always try to be unobtrusive. Rachel Weiss used to say, fat lot of good that does. You trying to be unobtrusive, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> but I always found a corner. And one day I heard some of the people on the set saying, uh, where's Deborah's jacket? Who has her glasses? Where's, uh, and I said, I'm wearing my glasses. I had my jacket on. Uh, and someone said, where is she? And they, I was in their sight line. And then I realized, of course, it wasn't me they were talking about, but it was Rachel Weiss. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, Rachel was quite happy and anxious for me to be on the set. But towards the end, she said, Deborah, sometimes I look up and I said, who is that woman over there? I'm Deborah Lipstadt. So it's a strange kind of thing. But uh, as you said in your introduction, Sadly, the film has an added relevance that none of us anticipated, I think including Jeff, the other producers. Uh, no one anticipated it would have this relevance. Uh, so on one hand, I'm glad for that because it's allowed for much more of a conversation about the film, but I'm sad for what it says about our society. So one more question for you, Deborah. Um, you know, you talk about the gift of this film being a new platform to invite people into a conversation that they may not have been a part of. Uh, many people never were aware of this trial. They didn't know that this was something that, that you had fought and won. Um, I happen to be a bit of a fangirl, so I read a lot about Deborah. And one thing that you wrote about recently, um, you, you penned an article in The Atlantic in which you described the Trump administration's statement on the Holocaust Remembrance Day. It was a statement that did not mention Jews or anti-Semitism. And you equated this to soft core Holocaust denial. I'd love for you to sort of explain what that concept means to people and why you're so passionate about calling it out. Um, Hardcore denial is what I fought David Irving on in the courtroom. You know, there is no, there were no gas chambers, there was no plan to kill the Jews. Hardcore denial denies the facts. Softcore denial is much more, to use a very highfalutin academic term, slippery, you know? It's much harder to pin down. Um, and the irony with the White House statement on Holocaust Remembrance Day is I was in Amsterdam for the Dutch first screening of the film in, in, in Dutch in, in Amsterdam, and it was late on a Friday, very busy day, and I was walking, I'd gone out for a walk along the canals, and my phone started to ping, 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 and it was either throw the phone in the canal, which would not have been a very rational thing to do, or see what it was, and of course it was people saying the, Holocaust, the White House had just issued this statement without mentioning Jews. At that point, the Trump administration was all of five days old, and I said, hold your fire, keep your powder dry. This is a mistake they'll back down, they'll correct it. Well, of course they didn't. I mean, that's where the soft core denial came in. First, one of the uh, spokespeople for the president said, oh, we're trying to be inclusive by not mentioning Jews. So, I mean, they might have mentioned Jews and lots of other victims, even though the, they're not part of the Holocaust. And this is not a matter of comparative pain. It's a matter of a historian trying to say, what's the Holocaust, what's the other persecutions, of which there were many that the Germans engaged in. Um, but she's, oh, we're trying to be inclusive. The minute you say, I'm trying to be inclusive, the unspoken statement there is, and you're trying to be exclusive, or the critics are trying to be exclusive. Then the White House Chief of Staff was given a number of opportunities by Chuck Todd on uh, Meet the Press, one of our leading um, Sunday morning uh, news shows, to back down, and he said, no, 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 the Holocaust is very sad, but 
we're, we did the right thing. Um, and then uh, finally, um, Sean Spicer, the, the press secretary said, the president went out of his way to issue this, why are we being criticized? As if to say, we did something nice for the Jews. Well, the Jews don't need a statement about Holocaust Remembrance Day. Women don't need statements about rape. African Americans don't need statements about uh, you know, unfair treatment, about slavery. It's the other side then. So it, it, it was this doubling down of redefinition without denial. And that's what I call soft core denial. And we see it in many other areas as well. Yeah. So Melina, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move over to you. You are a cognitive neuroscientist. Um, Melina does remarkable work. I really encourage you to get online and look at some of what she's doing. And when, after we talked yesterday, we had lunch, um, I went back and I was reminded of a quote by Salvador Dali, who's one of my favorite artists, who said, the difference between false memories and true ones is the same as jewels. It is always the fake ones that look most real, the most brilliant. I know in your work doing scanning of brains, you're starting to really dive into this area of fake memory versus real memory, particularly in an age where we seem to be in a new struggle of dis and misinformation. I'd love it if you would talk a little bit about your work and what it means in the context of a conversation about denial. Thank you. So, um, so I study learning and memory. I study how the brain forms memories and how it brings it back to mind. Um, and how that's relevant to this conversation here is that we learn our belief structures, right? We learn based on the world around us and based on um, the information that comes to us or doesn't come to us. Um, and so when you talk about misinformation and disinformation, um, you know, we're in a new era where we are consuming more information than we ever have before. And that's shaping our brains. It's shaping how we think about the world and how we interact with the world. And that's a really... Um, it's a beautiful uh, thing of opportunity, but it's also a, a thing of vulnerability because it means that if we are not the guardians of our brains, if we're not the guardians of what we put into our brains, we can start to shape a reality that may not necessarily be truth, that may not be the real reality. And so it's really important, and you know, maybe we'll, we'll get into this a little bit later, but it's really important, I think, to think about being a gatekeeper of the information that comes into your mind because it does literally physically change your mind. Um, and particularly if it's information that reinforces your worldview, right? It's something that we tend not to question. We tend to just let in indiscriminately. And so one of my kind of personal passion projects is really talking to people about being educated consumers of information in their world and how they can become kind of healthy skeptics of the information that comes in. Um, because it, again, it changes your brain structure and function. And that's, that's the core of who we are. We need to be, um, we need to be super protective of it. So I do, I, I scan people's brains and see how they change when um, they're learning new information and then when they bring that information back to mind. Um, I have done some work looking at whether you can change, intentionally change your brain patterns um, through deception and whether uh, an algorithm can actually tell whether your brain is um, under a state of deceiving or uh, truthfully remembering. And it turns out you can, you can be a brain-based memory detector, a brain-based pattern recognizer, um, such that your, your brain can look like it's seeing the truth, look like it's actually truthfully um, remembering something when you're not. And so that has implications um, for all sorts of um, kind of social issues, but specifically legal issues as well, which is one of the things that we work on. That's great. Um, ben, in many ways, what you do in the library exists to preserve memory. It's, it is a, not only to preserve it, but to create new memories. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Wiener Library in, in London, uh, it is a leading uh, archives on the Holocaust and the Nazi era. It houses over a million items that were collected uh, 
uh, in Germany uh, by Alfred Wiener and, 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 and Ben can do a much better job describing the mission of the organization, but how do you simultaneously make the library um, a place of learning about the past, but also evolve it to maintain a currency in what we're experiencing today? Okay, so, well, Alfred Wiener uh, had a, a, a strong, passionate belief in the power of truth, and that's why starting really from 1925, after he read Hitler's Mein Kampf, he began to accumulate documents and evidence of what the character of the Nazi party and its leadership was, and then once he was in exile in the Netherlands, he put on record what the regime was doing and what was becoming of its victims, and, and it went on like that through, through the war and through to today. So um, the, the power of the truth is something that we still believe in, that is if you look at the available evidence and weigh it up dispassionately, you will arrive at, at solid conclusions about what really happened. <clears throat> And much of what we do today is based on an, on an effort to uh, educate people in, in ways of doing that. So the, ho the Holocaust is an example of a genocide. It's a, pro probably the most documented genocide in human history. And one of the things we engage in is, is debate and discussion uh, and, and stimulating people to think about what can be learned from looking at the Holocaust in relation to, to other instances of, of mass persecution and mass murder. So we are, um, uh, Denial is a film of participant media and uh, we have a film coming uh, late this summer. Some of you may have seen the trailer online. It is an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power. It is the follow-up film from uh, An Inconvenient Truth, which brought uh, the story of climate change into the forefront. Climate is another place where we see extreme denial. Uh, Deborah, you raised vaccine denial. Vaccine denial, absolutely. And so I would love for all of you just to reflect a little bit on this current culture of denialism. Uh, what worries you most? And because we have an audience here of, of social change makers, where is there opportunity for all of us to make a difference in these places where we see resistance to truth? Um, first of all, I think it's one does, it's bringing calls to Newcastle to say, certainly to an audience like this, that uh, truth and facts are under assault. And as we've said, social media has flattened the difference between them. What disturbs me most is the extremism that is able to parade as rational opinion. Uh, if you look at the famous Lancet article, and I hesitate with medical people all around to, to talk about that, but uh, on, on vaccines, not only was it based on a time, 12, I think 12 examples, but most of them, when doctors looked at what they, at their own cases, they said, but that's been changed, that's been altered to fit the pre-existing conclusions. So we live in a world where people alter documents, alter facts to fit their pre-existing conclusions, exactly as you were talking about from a scientific basis. I think it puts a responsibility on us to check things out. Uh, I said this earlier, but I feel it so strongly uh, to go back, to look, not to repeat. Uh, the great gift of having this information superhighway, which I think was a term first created by Al Gore, um, having access to it means that we've got to drive responsibly and we can't just repeat things. Uh, it's very dangerous, it's very, very dangerous. Uh, you know, centuries ago, Galileo, uh, after having been forced to recant by the Vatican his correct observation that the Earth moved around the sun, um, he said, and yet it still moves. The truth is still there, but we, we have to act as guardians to it, and I think that that's, that's a big challenge, but an exceptionally important one. I agree. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the, the Lancet article that was the original um, 
article that first started uh, the uh, supposed link between autism and vaccines. Uh, it was uh, published by Andrew Wakeman. It has been retracted very publicly. He has been brought up on charges of fraud and child abuse of the kids in the study. It's an absolute atrocious thing, and yet we still have a huge, huge disinformation and misinformation campaign that are that is being waged by a lot of different celebrities with loud voices that are um, that are really perpetuating a, a mistruth. And there's there's so much that can be said to not disprove, but to show that you know autism can be can be determined in the in the womb. Autism can be determined way before vaccines. But the the correction of misinformation or the retraction of disinformation is so, so, so hard to do, particularly because when you first get that information, especially if it confirms your worldview, it builds a model, it builds a, a construct in your brain that is really, really solid. And if you don't deconstruct that in the right way, it's just, it's, it's not going to be, um, it's not gonna be deconstructed. Can I, if I can jump in here just as a historian, and you would know this as well, but certainly in the United States, conspiracy theories abound. They abound everywhere, but the United States, uh, uh, Richard Hofstadter's famous, the paranoid style of American politics. But I think what happens, and this goes, speaks to you, what you were saying about the science, is that the person who was sure that vaccines cause autism, or the Holocaust didn't happen, or whatever else it might be, the climate is not changing, when you bring them facts, they just simply put you in the box of the conspiracy theorists. You're part of the system and they dismiss you. And that's why I don't engage those people. Engaging those people is a waste of time. The people we have to engage are the people they might be influencing. Yeah, it's, really, it's a really uh, salient point because actually a lot of retraction techniques or a lot of um, people who try to correct misinformation and disinformation actually serve to really solidify the false beliefs or the, the um, incorrect beliefs. And so the, the actual campaign to provide the correct information will actually perpetuate it. We see this all the time in, you know, in autism and vaccines. We see it with climate change. We actually see it in education. I do a lot of work with teachers around the country um, correcting or talking to them about um, myths of the brain, myths of the mind, myths of learning. And you know, one of the biggest things that probably a lot of us in this room believe is something like, I learn better if I am shown something in auditory style or a visual style or a kinesthetic style. This concept of learning styles is this big, huge thing that has, per that has gone across the globe um, and yet has no empirical support for it. And yet almost every single one of us has that because it fits something that we know to be true in our hearts and minds that there is some individual difference in how I learn. But is it actually explained by that? Probably not. So it's, it's this really kind of sneaky thing where this disinformation can be implanted to support what you are feeling and what you're, what you're thinking. And, and that's why it's really hard to dismantle. But there actually is a science to myth busting. There is a science to correcting misinformation. It can be done, but it's it's tough, but you're right that it does reinforce. So to, to finish, um, to answer your question, what worries me is that we have created this culture of passive consumers of media, passive consumers of information, um, distrust of evidence, and, and actually balanced media. It's, it's really perpetuated a, a particular challenge when you give, when you give equal weight to an evidence-based side and an opinion-based side, or a side that has a huge consensus in the scientific literature and no consensus in the scientific literature, but they're given equal weight in the media, it suggests to the reader that there is equal weight, equal legitimacy to the arguments. And that's a, that's a problem, and we need to change that ethos. I don't know how to do it, that's what you guys are all for. Um, but, so the, the idea that as a, as, as a consumer of media, I need, to, I need to 
model and help educate um, healthy skepticism in how we guard what goes into our brains, but then also the, the people who are actually um, distributing the information also need to have a healthy skepticism and understand that this balance, this equal weighting of the two sides may not always be appropriate, may actually be causing harm. Thank you. And Ben? Uh, well, I'd like to offer a distinction between denial of, of the Holocaust and genocide and denial of something like, like vaccines, because denial of the Holocaust and denial of genocide is an inherent and necessary part of those processes. You cannot have a genocide without denying it, but you can have vaccines without denying them. So there, there is, there's a distinction to be made. Um, why we're in an age of, of wide, you know, denying more and more things and, and so on uh, is, I think, has been touched on by, by Melina in particular be, uh, in the way that the mainstream media treats things and, and this, this artificial balancing of, of matters. Uh, and to bring it back to, to the subject of the film, in the, in the years after the trial, Irving continued to surface on radio programs and TV programs uh, in discussion about these issues. And we at the library would always write to the producers and protest that they had, had used him, and we always received more or less the same reply, which was that they completely understood that we found him repugnant and so on, and they didn't like him either, uh, but they felt themselves to be under a duty to present both sides of the argument. And that's the, they fell into the trap. It's not an argument. Truth versus lies is not an argument, but they persist in, um, <laughs> in taking that stand, that you have to, if you have a, a statement in one direction, then you have to have the statement in the opposite direction. And that's not necessary. Can I just brief, very briefly follow up on that? I think one of the challenges is to people of the quote-unquote enlightened, liberal, small l, you know, academic uh, world of ideas to drive out of our heads that everything is open to debate. There are undisputable, indisputable facts, Galileo. Uh, they're things that are real. And, you know, sometimes, I don't know who said this, I wish I did, because he, he or she deserves credit. But some people say, oh, you have to keep an open mind. But sometimes your mind can be so open that your brains fall out. You know, and, and that's... <laughs> then you have something to study right there. Um, but that's exactly what you're talking about. Uh, we have to keep an open mind. Well, would you put on, uh, would you have an earth scientist who's talking about the shape of the world or something, and then put on someone, well, this person thinks the world is flat. I mean, there's certain things that just don't go, and they're not... Not everything is open to debate, and I know that sounds very unenlightened, but it's the only way we're going to protect the truth. I agree. I think um, I think that the equal weighting piece is is very dangerous for people who want to debate. Let them debate and talk about the the weighting of each side. Right? One may not be a side, but it still deserves a voice. I do think, um, but it can be said here is the balance of the evidence, and here's somebody's opinion. Yeah. So I want to be mindful of time, um, but I really want to give the last word to Deborah with, with a little bit of a personal reflection. Uh, my grandfather, Adolf Jack Zeller, was an immigrant from Germany. He was lucky enough to escape and live a wonderful life in the US. Uh, when he, um, when my grandmother passed away, he dedicated the rest of his life to volunteering at the Holocaust Museum, and, and Deborah was one of his heroes. And so to share a stage with her, for all of you get the opportunity to be with someone as courageous and heroic as Deborah. Uh, I'm going to give her the parting words, but I do just want to offer my own reflection that it's moments like this that give me courage to go out and feel more empowered to fight against things that uh, just, they're, they're unjust and wrong. And so on behalf of the whole audience, I just really want to express 
deep, deep gratitude for everything you've done and continue to do. This may sound, thank you, thank you. Um, this may sound strange. I, well, now that there's a movie and I'm, I have a, a even larger megaphone, for those of you from North America, I'm, I'm going to be addressing the entire cadet corps and faculty at West Point uh, right at, on Holocaust Memorial Day in uh, Yom HaShoah in the end of April. Um, I'm, I'm very appreciative of all that, but I'm also appreciative of the fact I know how many people irrespective of their religious outlook, their ethnic background, their whatever group they may be, gender, um, who would love to have the opportunity to stand up against the haters. And I got that opportunity. I got that opportunity with the help of a lot of people who, who made sure we could fight this battle and fight it well. Um, and uh, to reflect on my own religious tradition, we have in, in Judaism a concept of acts of loving kindness, uh, taking care of the sick, welcoming the stranger, uh, looking after the needy, the orphan. Um, but the highest act of loving kindness is when you take care of the dead. Because in any of the other acts, you may not do it because you're expecting a reciprocation. You know, I don't take care of the sick, because oh, none of us expect that we'll be sick, but you know that that's what it means to live in community. But when you take care of the dead, um, it's said in, in, in Jewish tradition that you're most closely emulating God, because the dead can't pay you back, and we can't pay God back for what was done for us, uh, giving us life, giving us, allowing us to be part of this world. And so even though it was hard and it was difficult and it was scary and it took literally six years out of my life, my professional life, my personal life, um, I feel very lucky to have had that opportunity. I didn't write my book about denial expecting to have that opportunity. I didn't go into this field expecting that I would do that. Uh, but I got a, to stand up to one of the bad guys and with the help of a lot of people, a great legal team, great historians, um, and the support of a lot of people, uh, we beat them, and that feels pretty good, so thank you. So on behalf of, of the panel and our whole Skull team, we again, we just want to thank you for coming tonight, and uh, thank you to this wonderful, wonderful group of panelists.